This is ABC 7 Extra. Good evening, I'm Saul Sainz, and this is ABC 7 Extra Sunday Edition. Merry Christmas, and thank you for permitting us into your homes this Sunday evening. I hope you're spending it with loved ones for your Christmas. Well, tonight, we look back to the year that was. If you're like most of us, uh, most of the public, we all cannot wait to put 2020 in the rearview mirror and welcome 2021 filled with hope. With hope, 2021 delivered in spectacular fashion. This was the year we learned we too can travel to space with the launch of space tourism. It was also the year vaccines protecting us against COVID-19 were widely available, giving us breathing room in the fight against the deadly virus that claimed so many of our loved ones' lives. And what better way for all past ones to celebrate than by cheering our minors to a much better season that came complete with a bowl game. Billionaire Sir Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos launched the race to space and the borderland was given a front row seat, both launching from our own backyards. If we can do this, just imagine. First was Branson, who wrote into the history books, launching from Spaceport America north of Las Cruces aboard Virgin Galactic's Spaceship Two. Branson and crew members rocketed to the edge of space. Not to be outdone, Amazon founder Bezos became the second non-astronaut to blast off into space on board Blue Origin's New Shepard from Van Horn, Texas. While Virgin Galactic's maiden voyage was its only trip to space, Blue Origin went up twice more, making headlines with Star Trek's I'm William so Shatner, filled with emotion about who became the first 90-year-old to go to space. Months later, Inside he was followed by Good Morning show. America Good morning co-anchor and Football Hall of Famer Michael Strahan. You may tradition. recall weather Bringing forced a gap down. between the scheduled flight and the, the actual liftoff help. several days later. The man accustomed to gaps landed safely back to Earth, making history as the first journalist in space. But it was un- Believable. It's hard to even describe it. Americans witness an insurrection. Hundreds attending a Donald Trump rally following his election defeat at the polls to Joe Biden stormed the U.S. Capitol protesting the outcome of the election. Our Congresswoman Veronica Escobar in the gallery as the mob tried to break in. In the end, the Electoral College proclaimed Biden the victor and the results were certified by Vice President Mike Pence. Lawmakers continue to this day trying to determine if the attack on the U.S. Capitol was triggered by Trump supporters determined to punish lawmakers, including Pence, for an election they believe was stolen from Trump. Vaccines against COVID-19 were introduced in late 2020, but became widely available in 2021, bringing hope to El Pasoans and light at the end of the COVID tunnel. Vaccination rates soared to almost 80% before the vaccine became available to children. As vaccination rates increased, venues like concerts started opening back up to the public. There was no bigger fan participation in town than UTEP football. Minor football turned the program around, drawing thousands to Sun Bowl Stadium. With all its wins, UTEP was even invited to its first bowl since 2014. Although the outcome was not favorable, the bowl appearance gave a boost to the minor football program and to an entire Sun City ready to emerge from 2020 lockdown. I want to welcome two journalists who helped chronicle and guide us through the events that transpired in 2021. First, co-worker and main anchor Eric Elkin. Welcome. Also joining us is online publication founder and CEO Bob Moore for El Paso Matters. Gentlemen, welcome. We have a lot of ground to cover, so let's get started. I want to start with you, Bob. Let's talk about the significance of the broad vaccine availability in the borderland. There were some hiccups in the rollout, but also altogether, El Paso had some of the highest vaccination rates in Texas. Coupled with that, massive confusion over mask mandates. Yeah, I think uh, this year has been really um, marked by challenges on so many levels and, and confusion, too. I mean, the good news for our community, I think, uh, as you said, is we really led the state in uh, getting vaccines early and getting a good chunk of our population vaccinated. Uh, but even with that, we still had, you know, tens of thousands of people uh, who didn't get vaccinated or fully vaccinated. And so that led to some, some really dire consequences. And we lost a lot more of our neighbors than we, than we needed 
needed to this year, and that's really sad. Uh, and then you have the constant fighting between local leaders and, the, and Governor Abbott over whether they can place um, um, mask mandates in to help try to prevent the, the, the spread of the, the virus. And, and you know, eventually, I think the governor largely prevailed in that. And so um, that's one tool that other states have been able to use to, to help check the flow that's not available here in Texas. In the state, it was uh, it was left up, up to uh, individuals and businesses, right? Yeah, and, and I think, you know, just anecdotally, as I go around town, I think there's a real uh, high voluntary use of masks. I think uh, um, because of what this community has gone through, people recognize the seriousness of the virus and on their own uh, largely are, are taking steps to protect themselves, but that's not universal. Um, and I think in particular settings, uh, especially where young people gather, uh, you tend to see lower use of masks. Eric, I want to bring you in. Now, with high vaccination rates uh, came the reopening of our borders to non-essential travel. How big was this? Obviously, it's huge for the community. I mean, you have to go back to the spring of 2020 when the non-essential travel uh, stop happened, and it was just extended month by month by month. And so every, every month we kept reporting on the fact that that was extended. But I don't think there was ever any real indication or sense that that wasn't going to be extended until we got into 2021 and got past that point of getting to that higher vaccination status that we had as a community. And even then it was still a little bit of a struggle, a little bit up in the air as to when that would ultimately happen. I'm sure many of you remember County Judge Ricardo Samaniego uh, trying to put together pilot programs, do what he could, do his part to better vaccinate the other side of the border with some of the programs that he did at the port of entry in Tornillo to get Watensons vaccinated and Maquila workers vaccinated so that he could encourage people like Veronica Escobar to then take that to uh, Congress Capitol Hill and encourage this administration to uh, loosen some of the restrictions because obviously, as we know, we are a community, a binational community. We are not just El Paso or El Paso in New Mexico. Uh, we rely so heavily on that cross-border travel. And so ultimately getting to that, I, I think there was a lot of anticipation as to how busy the ports would be once uh, that non-essential travel restriction was lifted. and. There might have been a little bit uh, less in the way of travel that we were than we were, what we were expecting, but you know I think slowly but surely things will start to trickle back to uh, what we were seeing pre-pandemic levels, and especially now with the holidays, uh, obviously there's a lot of concern with the variants out there right now, but uh, it does seem like people are starting to get back to a more normal way of life, and uh, a large part of that was being able to cross the border because there are a lot of people who went a year and a half who hadn't seen. Uh, loved ones and family members, uh, not because of any other reason other than they just couldn't. As well as the purchasing power, of course. Right. Yeah, the economic side of things, of course. Uh, you've been down there, uh, d done the story many times of the businesses right along the ports of entry there, uh, r right, right downtown, and the importance of, of getting that foot traffic there to downtown, of course, with Winterfest coming back this year for uh, the downtown area as well, just getting more buzz, more people, more foot traffic downtown at the restaurants, the businesses. Uh, just getting more money pumped into the local economy, whether it be from El Pasoans or Juarezans. Bob, COVID-19 carried over from 2020, as did immigration. Even though Border Patrol saw record numbers, the 2021 surge was different, with unaccompanied minors coming to our borders in record numbers, and with that came mistreatment of minors, like the two little sisters thrown over the border barrier in Santa Teresa. Yeah, I, I think that immigration is always a very um, a complex issue to, to discuss. And, you know, all of the problems that uh, have been driving migration uh, uh, northward for, for decades are still there. And then this year it's compounded by uh, the uh, uh, displacement caused by the pandemic. And, and that's most obvious with Haitians. You know, you had uh, these tens of thousands of Haitians who, after the earthquake in 2010, settled successfully in South America and were making good lives for themselves. But then the pandemic came and disrupted uh, their lives there. And so they were forced on this uh, further uh, northern migration up to the U.S. Uh, border. Uh, despite President Biden's campaign promises to make significant changes to the Trump administration's uh, policies around asylum in particular, that hasn't changed. Uh, one of the reasons we've seen such high numbers crossing the border is because of what's known as Title 42, where they were expelling people back as soon as they crossed. And this set up this constant revolving uh, uh, practice of getting kicked back, coming back over. And so the numbers tend to get a little bit inflated there. But these are the 
uh, huge challenges that I, I think, unfortunately, uh, our country views as a border issue. And it's not really a border issue. It's a global issue around climate change, government impunity, violence, and now the economic disruption caused by the pandemic. It's a very, very difficult issue that's not going away. All right, Bob and Eric, we're going to take a really quick break. You're watching ABC7 Extra. When we come back, my guests and I will take a look back at major flooding the borderland experience that claimed the lives of three people. You're watching ABC7 Extra Sunday edition, where news comes first. Chevy is taking people lots of places this holiday. We're going swimming. We're going to find the perfect tree. We're going to Nana. Let your Chevy dealer take you there with Chevy Red Tags, where the price you see is the price you pay. Happy holiday from Chevy. Find new places, find new roads. Very well qualified buyers may also be eligible to get 0% financing on all Silverado Crew Cab pickups. Plus, you may qualify for $500 bonus cash when you find your red tag, or use that bonus cash to get $1,750 total value on this Silverado. Not sure exactly what goes in your blue recycle bin? Take the City of El Paso Environmental Service Department's free recycling challenge to learn how we can flip the contamination rate from 32% to 23% by the year 2023. Become a recycling black belt today. Call, visit our website, or check out our app to find out more. <laughs> Surprise! It's a new Buick. Mm -hmm. Got me a new Buick? And there are more guests inside. Is this a rear vision camera? Yes, it is. <laughs> Look at the dogs! <laughs> there are so many gifts in here, I don't even know where to start. Watch this, Mom. Alexa? Turn on holiday lights. This year, give the gift of technology in every Buick SUV. Get $37.50 purchase cash on this Enclave Essence. Plus, current eligible Buick owners get 500 additional allowance. See your El Paso Las Cruces Buick dealers. Casa Nissan is shaking things up this holiday season. Whoa! We want to make your holiday dreams come true with big selection, huge savings, and more trade-in value than ever. Plus, you can buy online in just four easy steps, and we'll deliver it right to your door. Get 0% financing on a new Nissan, including the all-new 2022 Frontier. Merry Christmas from all of us at Casa Nissan. Home of the nice guys. Yeah! Have a story idea the Borderland needs to know about? It's easy to share it with the ABC7 News team. Just click the Share tab at KVIA.com or in the KVIA News app. You can also email us at news at KVIA.com. Welcome back to ABC7 Extra Sunday Edition. Our New Mexico mobile newsroom was running all over the state, keeping us informed about everything from a state police officer being shot and killed in broad daylight to an Otero County commissioner being arrested for his role in the January 6th insurrection. New Mexico also legalized recreational marijuana, and sadly, an education leader died in a car crash. Kate Beery looks back for ABC7 Extra. In New Mexico, the investigation into the January 6th riot reached Otero County Commissioner Coy Griffin. He's accused of breaching police lines. Griffin says officers themselves removed the barricades. This year, he also survived a recall. In February, a violent shootout with police right on I-10 ended with the death of Omar Felix Cueva. The man had just shot New Mexico State Police Officer Darian Jarrett in cold blood during a traffic stop. And Las Cruces lost a bright light with the death of school superintendent Karen Trujillo. Serving Las Cruces is something I'm just thrilled to be able to do. She was hit and killed while walking her dogs. The district honored her life. And the legislative session delivered new redistricting maps and notably legalized recreational marijuana. And that will no doubt be one of our top stories come 2022. Stay tuned. I also want to welcome back my co-worker and ABC7 main anchor, Eric Elkin. Also joining us is online publication, El Paso Matters founder and CEO, Bob Moore. Thank you, too, for joining us. Bob, one of the biggest national stories that directly impacted the borderland was the arrival of Afghan refugees. Yeah, the, this was, uh, I, I think, another example of our community responding in, in a spectacular manner uh, to a, a crisis not of our, our own making. Uh, obviously, we all watched in horror, I think, as the, the, uh, the evacuation from Afghanistan just went haywire, and uh, uh, we see all of these people sort of running down the, the tarmac, and, you know, these are, these are people and their families who were of great assistance to U.S. soldiers during two decades of war. All of a sudden, they're they're kind of uh, uh, 
uh, in great grave danger. We have to evacuate uh, tens of thousands of them. And Fort Bliss uh, was one of the main uh, relocation centers. And I, I think that, um, uh, especially the Armed Services YMCA, did a great job of giving El Pasoans an opportunity to respond where they could come in and bring some assistance uh, uh, to these families. Uh, obviously, most of them are going to go on uh, elsewhere, but we, we probably will see a few of these Afghan refugees settling in El Paso. And we've got a great history as a community of making uh, newcomers feel, feel welcome here. So. Um, uh, it, it'll be interesting to watch that as we move forward. Eric, all our viewers and readers were watched in awe over the handling of the food pantry bank fiasco, primarily because it seemed like negotiations were held through the press. It became a he said, she said. Break it down for us. Yeah, I mean, that was really one of those uh, wow moments of 2021 when you look back at it, because as you mentioned, so well, it happened uh, very much uh, through the public eye. That is not something that happens often in these cases, especially with two entities, uh, with the food bank and the city, that work so closely together. So you have one side making an accusation that the food bank is in default, and the def and the food bank alleging that it had done every step, every had taken every step uh, properly, and had done every right thing, and it had invited the city and uh, city leaders to come in and inspect any time that they needed. And so you really ended up having this situation, as you alluded to, so that turned into a he said, she said, a situation. But really, I. Think I think uh, what, what we didn't want to lose in all of that, or lose sight of in all of that, is the fact that the food bank is so important to this community because really at the end of the day it's about the people and the people that it serves. And, it's, and that was none, uh, none more evident than this time right now during the pandemic because so many people who may not have relied on the food bank all of a sudden found themselves in a situation where they did need to lean on someone to help and the food bank was often the one there and so I think a lot of people's trepidations and concerns as they were watching this yes there was that public back and forth and the spat and trying to sort out really who was right or wrong in this situation but people were watching with the concern of well what does this mean for the food bank and that's one of the questions I kept asking uh, behind the scenes was what does this ultimately mean for the food bank as long as everything can keep going forward from here and cooler heads can prevail and they can sort everything out uh, that is one of the more important things for this community because it serves so many people as i said and it's going to continue to do so through the rest of this pandemic and beyond and so ultimately at the end of the day uh, it was nice to see that it was it was settled and uh, they figured it out and you, you didn't really get a, a full sense of of closure as to what actually transpired and you still have both sides disagreeing on certain topics but at the end of the day it does seem like that's something that we haven't talked much about since and the food bank is there to serve its purpose uh, for the people and make sure that people who need food and who are hungry here in El Paso have a means to get it. Absolutely. El Pasoans saw record-breaking rainfall prompting street flooding, triggering traffic chaos. Storm Tracker Chief Meteorologist Dave Spielman gives us a look back at weather in 2021. Doppler Dave in the ABC 7 Weather Lab. We're talking about the big weather story of 2021. And really the major story is the flooding that we had. If you look here, August 12th through the 14th, maybe many of you remember that. We had anywhere from four to six inches of rain in just a couple of days, La Union, New Mexico, Central, Northeast El Paso had the abundance of rainfall, three deaths being reported, and secondary to some of the heavy rain, the latest season freeze on record occurred December 20th when we got down to 29. We tied the record that was set way back in 1939. I want to bring back my co-worker and ABC7 main anchor Eric Elkin and El Paso Matters founder and CEO Bob Moore. Eric, you watched the entire flooding event from beginning to end and pretty much called a play-by-play -play as it was unfolding. Yeah, it was a surreal moment. I mean, this was go goes back to June 28th at Monday, and uh, it started to rain in that afternoon, and we kind of knew that there was a potential. Doppler had called a, a first alert, so we were aware, and we were ready for this potential, but I don't think anyone anticipated ultimately what ended up happening. We came on the air for ABC 7 at 4. I had told our, our, uh, my co or my, uh, our, my coworker, Mark Ross, that, hey, I'll go in the alert center, and if you need to toss to me, you need me to help you out here, uh, just, just do that, and I'll, I'll take us through some traffic cams and see what we see. And so we started the newscast that way at 4 o'clock, 
and the first couple shots were of downtown and we could see the roads were wet but you know you just it was it seemed pretty typical for for what we were experiencing at that moment but it was as we kind of advanced those cameras up as up around Asarco that we started to see some of the ponding on I-10 and then when we really noticed and I really noticed how severe the situation was becoming was when we got to Paisano at Executive uh, not far from uh, the border barrier there at Mount Cristo Rey uh, that we saw that there was there were impassable roads and there were cars that had nowhere to go and obviously you always hear the the phrase turn around don't drown and so live on the air I'm seeing cars that are starting to make that attempt to drive through not knowing how deep that water is what the currents are like underneath or what uh, objects or obstacles could be within that water and so it was a very dangerous situation that was playing out live on the air and then we ultimately got to the situation uh, up near uh, the top of Thunderbird with the, the hiking the, the hiker who uh, unfortunately died in the, in, in the, uh, from being swept away by the floodwaters there. But uh, that day in particular was really what started a very intense monsoon season for us. Yeah, Bob, unfortunately the flooding claimed the lives of three people, the, the hiker that Eric just mentioned, as well as a grandmother and granddaughter trapped inside their home as flood waters were rising. Did this event, which was supposed to be a 100-year event, did this event highlight some of the infrastructure problems that we may have here in El Paso still? Yeah, and, and it prompted the uh, El Paso Water, uh, which runs the stormwater utility, to revise some of its plans. I think it's, it, we, we have to acknowledge you can't tie any specific weather event to climate change and, and blame it. But we do know that we're seeing much more frequent intense storms in El Paso and across the world um, uh, as a result of climate change. And so uh, what we saw this summer... Um, you know, we used to refer to 100-year floods and 500-year floods, uh, which can be misunderstood. But the, the, that level of storm activity is going to continue. And, and uh, uh, as we saw this year, our, our stormwater infrastructure cannot handle it. And so one of the decisions that the Public Service Board, which oversees El Paso Water, recently made is they're going to expedite what had been a 20-year plan uh, to uh, bring in more uh, uh, stormwater infrastructure and condense it into 10 years. So to try to build out some of that infrastructure more quickly, one of the results of that is going to be uh, that we're all going to be paying higher uh, rates on our water bills uh, to, to pay for that accelerated construction. But, you know, the, the, a, as you noted, there are lives at stake here, and, uh, and this, these are issues that we're going to be dealing with. Bob, I want you to predict what you believe will happen in 2022 as a result of El Paso water pumping wastewater into the Rio Grande. Do you think they will face some fines? The, the, the really disturbing part of all of this is we don't have good answers uh, uh, to that question. And Danielle Prokop, who covers the environment for us, has been asking these questions regularly and reported recently that the EPA has began inquiring about um, what, uh, what the damage might be to that. But I, I think, you know, it's just shocking that in 2021, uh, a community like El Paso is left with no alternative other than to dump 10 million gallons of raw sewage into the Rio Grande a day for for weeks on end. Hopefully that'll come uh, to, a, to a halt uh, uh, in, in next week. But it, it's a big issue, and I don't think anybody has a really good understanding of the ecological damage that's been done, uh, both short-term and long-term. Right. We're going to take another quick break. You're watching ABC7 Extra. Still ahead, UTEP football scores big wins, and after a long absence, the Miners were invited to the New Mexico Bowl. We'll be back. Compared to many SUVs, a Volkswagen can save you money on maintenance. Isn't that illuminating? Now's the time to sign then drive. Hurry in during the Volkswagen sign then drive event and lease a new 2022 Atlas Crossport for zero down, zero deposit, zero first month payment, and zero to its signing. To grow up healthy and happy, kids need fun experiences that stick with them forever. A group of friends that keeps them playful and the freedom to just be a kid. The pandemic took so much of this away from them, but now you can protect your kids the same way you've protected yourself. The vaccine is finally available for kids age 5 through 11. It's safe, effective, and doctor approved. Get your kids the protection they deserve and schedule a vaccine appointment today at vaccinenm.org kids. 
Tis the season, the season to save at Oscar Leaser's Hyundai of El Paso. Save with 0% financing up to 48 months, plus no payments for 90 days on all 2022 Hyundai models in stock. That's no interest and no payments for 90 days. Decorate your driveway with an Elantra, Sonata, Kona, Tucson, or Santa Fe. And sign and drive with zero do it signing, zero cash out of pocket. Tis the season, the season to save at Oscar Leaser's Hyundai of El Paso. There is nothing more important than family. It is for this very reason that the attorneys at Sherla Gate have been here for 45 years if you or a loved one has been wronged or suffered a serious injury or death. We understand that nothing can replace a life full of health and meaning. That is why fighting for your family is our top priority. This season, celebrate those who mean the most to you. When it matters most, the Sherla Gate family is always there for yours. Happy Holidays! Compared to many SUVs, a Volkswagen can save you money on maintenance. Isn't that illuminating? Now's the time to sign then drive. Hurry in during the Volkswagen sign then drive event and lease a new 2022 Atlas Crossport for zero down, zero deposit, zero percent of payment, and zero to its signing. Welcome back to ABC 7 Extra Sunday Edition. The last time the UTEP Miners played in a bowl was in 2014, and after several losing seasons, the Miners turned the program around. UTEP basketball also scored a new head coach. ABC7 Sports Director Adrian Ochoa gives us a look back at sports in 2021. Sports in El Paso in 2021 was all about change. New faces, new experiences. And when all was said and done, it was the year to remember. Just ask the UTEP Miners. They got a new head basketball coach in 2021, Joe Golding. The UTEP football team was back in a bowl game for the first time in seven years. And the UTEP volleyball team, they got their first win in the postseason in program history. It was also a year of change for professional sports teams in El Paso. The Locomotive FC lost their first head coach in club history, Mark Lowry, departing the club after three seasons. The team then welcomed their new head coach, John Hutchinson. And staying on the pitch, the soccer world got introduced to the phenomenal youngster from San Elizario, Ricardo Pepe, making waves in MLS and with the U.S. national team. The borderland has been on a roll, producing talent in the world of sports. Aaron Jones continues to cement his legacy with the Green Bay Packers in a season that started on a somber note following the death of his father. And on the ice, El Paso became Hockeyville, USA, the city getting to host an NHL preseason game. While back on the gridiron, the NMSU Aggies welcomed their new head football coach, Jerry Kill. And we can't forget the memorable seasons for Kenya Theo, Riverside, and Eastwood, all three teams making it to the Sweet 16 of the state playoffs. Changes and experiences. El Paso was along for the ride in 2021, and we can't wait to see what 2022 has in store. I bet it will be just as awesome. Adrian Ochoa, ABC7. I also want to welcome back my co-worker and ABC7 main anchor, Eric Elkin. Also joining us for this third and final segment is El Paso Matters founder and CEO, Bob Moore. Eric. Texas governor was busy in 2021. He held several special sessions and was able to get past important legislation such as abortion laws, gun laws, voting laws. Democrats weren't exactly on board and even fled Austin in protest. Yeah, that was another one of those uh, kind of surreal moments because you see it playing out in real time. First, you see the buses departing and then all of a sudden uh, the plane taking off and heading to Washington, D.C. And that ended up lasting uh, for a couple of weeks as well as the holdout uh, lasted through a big portion of the summer. And that became a, a big topic as ultimately you knew that they were going to have to come back and uh, ultimately Republicans were likely going to get their way in what they were trying to pass because Governor Greg Abbott at the time had promised I'll just keep calling special session after special session after special session as long as he needed to. And that is ultimately what he did. And they got through a lot. And now we're seeing some of those laws, uh, of course, challenge some of that legislation now challenged at the federal level. So it really is an ongoing story, especially the, the abortion law. That is something that is uh, very hotly contested uh, and will be, I, I think, probably continue to be so, uh, not just here in Texas, but across the rest of the country for much of 2022 and probably beyond as well. Bob, this was also the year local news became part of an exciting venture, the Puente News Collaborative. Can you elaborate on that, please? 
Yeah, uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk about that. Both El Paso Matters and, and AB7, ABC7 are partners in this. We're in a that rapidly changing media landscape, uh, uh, we're, we've seen, especially at the local level, kind of a downsizing of, of journalism. And so one of the things that uh, the collaborative is hoping to address is to, to bring together various partners on, on both sides of our border to really take a look at, at uh, really significant issues uh, in both English and Spanish. Um, uh, we've, uh, this year we focused on several issues we've been talking about tonight. Um, uh, Eric just mentioned abortion. Uh, we, that, uh, we took a deep dive into that. Migration issues, COVID-19. And the idea is to really get a good grasp on how these issues, issues are affecting the border region as a whole rather than just kind of looking at what's happening in El Paso what's happening in Ciudad Juarez, because all of these things work together tightly, and, and you know, the, the, the virus doesn't uh, respect borders, it moved back and forth, and our journalism needs to keep up with, with that kind of storytelling. Mm -hmm. Eric, we had one night, when we, when we least expected it, something happening out at the El Paso International Airport, a plane was forced to land because of either carbon monoxide poisoning or gas leak, what was it? Yeah, that was the Frontier Airlines flight that was scheduled to go from Las Vegas to San Antonio. It had been delayed on the tarmac there in uh, Las Vegas due to a fuel line, a uh, mechanical, anyone who's flown, there's probably a time or two that you've been on a plane and you've been stuck thinking you're all boarded, you're ready to go, and all of a sudden you have a mechanical issue that pops up. And anyone who has experience that knows that that could mean you spend hours or you get booted off the plane, you have to find another, your flight's canceled altogether. Uh, for this uh, flight, uh, they were still able to take off and, and make their way to San Antonio, but it was midway through the flight uh, that we heard reports of a potential um, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning was what it ended up being, is what people were being treated for because of a, a, a fuel line uh, issue which was being addressed back in Las Vegas. And so we started to, our, our uh, assignment desk uh, person uh, here at ABC7, our, our digital content director, Jim Parker, actually heard during the scanners that they were preparing, uh, crews here on the ground in El Paso were preparing for that emergency landing because of the mid-flight disturbance and that there were several passengers who were falling ill on the, uh, on the plane. And so we didn't know exactly what was going on at the time, but as it all evolved, they ended up landing here. We sent our crews out there. We were able to get exclusive video of uh, passengers being uh, taken off the plane, some with carrying children and babies and infants. Uh, others had to be actually treated with, by ambulances there uh, right at the gate. And ultimately, uh, no one ended up being hospitalized, but uh, so it wasn't as bad of a situation as, as we feared it could have been. Uh, but it was a very scary situation. That's when we actually got a call from uh, one of the passengers to our newsroom, uh, D. Hart, who was uh, from San Antonio, was flying back home, and she was actually getting the information from ABC7, from what we had posted online at KVI.com, because Frontier was not telling them what was going on. And so it was a very scary situation uh, for her and all the passengers. She kind of played through what happened uh, as they landed, as they opened up the, the window shade and saw all these flashing lights. You can imagine you're a little discombobulated Scary, yeah. and unsure, uncertain of what's going on. So it was a, a bit of a harrowing experience for a lot of those passengers, uh, but we're grateful to her for sharing her story with us uh, so that we can convey to our audience uh, what exactly was going on that night at the El Paso International Airport. This next question is for both of you. Looking ahead in 2022, what do you think will be some of the biggest stories? We have Beto O'Rourke running for governor, COVID variants, what else, Bob? Uh, I think we, we have to start with uh, the, the crumbling of democratic institutions in this country uh, and whether uh, uh, the, the pluralistic democratic society that we've known and professed to love for so long uh, is really going to be there in, in the future. Uh, one thing we haven't talked in depth about tonight was, uh, because it wasn't a, a directly local story, but the insurrection at the Capitol on, on January 6th. Um, uh, and then the subsequent uh, uh, continuation of the big lie about uh, the election outcomes. Um, uh, I, I think we've, be, and the weakening of journalism, especially at the local level, ties into this too. I think one of the things we need to watch for in 2022 and then going forward is will those uh, uh, democratic institutions continue to hold or, or will they continue to, to buckle? This is a, a really concerning time in our history, I think. In the 30 seconds that we have left, uh, Eric, what do you think? 
Well, I think it's going to start with COVID, of course. I know you mentioned it, but we're living in a time right now with a brand new variant with Omicron. And I, I think a lot of people were thinking we could get to a certain point, especially with the vaccines, where we start to get away from it. But obviously, this isn't going away. We have to adapt to a new norm. And I think how we continue to evolve as this pandemic evolves, that's something that we'll be talking about uh, from January 1 all the way through 2022. Bob and Eric, thank you so much for joining us and thank you at home for joining us. But before we leave, I want to acknowledge a void left in the borderland with the passing of a very influential person who touched the lives of thousands of UTEP students. Dr. Diana Natalicio was the longest serving UTEP president, serving three decades at the helm of the university. Dr. Natalicio is hailed as a pioneer who took a small West Texas university and helped it grow into a national research institution. She worked long and hard to make education available to Latinos, both here in El Paso as well as across the border. In fact, UTIP enrollment grew from 15,000 to more than 25,000 students. In 2019, Dr. Natalicio was named a recipient of the Conquistador Award, the city of El Paso's highest honor after stepping down Natalicio died at the age of 82 in September. I remember talking to Dr. Natalicio the day she announced her retirement. She told me the one thing that she wanted to see most was minor football having a winning season. Picks up Dr. Natalicio, the minors went to a bowl game this year. On behalf of everyone involved in bringing you ABC7 Extra Sunday Edition, Happy New Year. We'll see you in 2022. Good night y buenas noches.